Hi, so uh, uh, welcome to 8551. Uh, we're going to just do a couple of problems here uh, out of Shankar, a couple of the exercises, uh, just to help everyone make, just to make sure that everyone has a rough idea of how to get started with these problems. Uh, if it's been a while since you've taken a physics class or uh, you just haven't done a lot of problems like this, or maybe you've been, uh, took a year or two off between college and graduate school, um, I thought this might be helpful. We don't actually have time built into the schedule for a recitation, uh, which might be useful uh, for this type of class, and so we're just going to run through and do a couple of examples. Um, so we're starting in, in Chapter 1 of Shankar, which is really just the mathematical underpinnings of quantum mechanics. Um, the basic idea is that given the laws of quantum mechanics, or the rules that govern its behavior, what can we deduce just from the rules? So we're not doing examples, we're not doing particle in a box, we're trying to understand some of the basic fundamental principles behind quantum mechanics. Okay. And so the first thing that we need to be familiar with is uh, that quantum mechanics happens in what's called a vector space. Um, and a vector space has rules. And if a certain set of properties or uh, state cats or functions don't obey those rules, then they're not going to be valid quantum mechanical systems. Okay? So the rules uh, for state cats are given over here. Uh, for vector space, we have to have uh, scalar multiplication, scalar addition, uh, commutative associative properties, and all of that good jazz. Um, and so uh, the first exercise that we're going to do is exercise 1.1.2. <clears throat> and the idea is to show, uh, given the, the, the following set of rules for addition and multiplication, uh, uh, we can define vectors as, uh, by three numbers, A, B, and C. And the goal here is to show that the set of vectors that form A, B, and 1 do not form uh, a valid vector space. And so to do this, we're going to use one of the common tools that you'll see in in uh, mathematical physics, which was we're going to prove that that is true uh, by proof by contradiction. Right? And so what we're going to do, might be a while since you've seen that, is we're going to assume hmm, that A, B, and 1, the set of A, B, and 1 vectors, forms a vector space. Now, if those vectors do form a vector space, then they have to obey all the rules on the previous page. And we can check and see whether or not they do. Okay. And so let's try, uh, is there a null vector? Right? So if, let's just pick out one of these rules. Is there a null vector? Can I say uh, null vector? And according to the null vector, 0 plus a, b, 1 has to be equal to a, b, 1. What vector will we say that the null vector is made of? And here we already run into a problem. This vector, right, which would be the natural null vector, isn't part of our vector set, right? It doesn't obey the rules. This last digit isn't 1. So that can't be the null vector. It's not, wouldn't be in our vector space. Now we can see that actually this type of uh, grouping, this AD1, disobeys most of the rules for vector space. Right? If we have let D equal AD1 and let W equal CD1, then according to these rules, V plus W would be equal to A plus C, B plus D, and 2. And the number 2 doesn't fit into our rules. And so we can say that this doesn't form a vector space. And the general idea that we're going to see a lot is with proof by contradiction. Assume that it's true and then show that there's a logical contradiction uh, with the law of quantum mechanics, or the laws of, of the thing that we're verifying. All right, so let's do uh, this next one, exercise 1.1.4. Consider the following three elements from a vector space of real two by two matrices. So we have vector one, two, and three. Now, each of these vectors is really a matrix, 
but they're going to be a single element in a vector space. Okay. And so the question for this exercise is, are they linear depend linearly dependent? Uh, <clears throat> and then show evidence to support your claim. And so the way that we're going to do this is to assume that they are linearly dependent. And because what does linear dependence mean? Linear dependence means that if we take some constant times vector 1 plus a second constant, we'll call that beta, times vector 2, that we can get vector 3. And that we can add some linear combination of vector 1 and vector 2 to get vector 3. Now, uh, let's go one step further and say what does that actually tell us? Well, alpha 1 is equal to 0 alpha, zero, zero. Beta two is equal to the matrix beta, beta, beta zero. And so alpha one plus beta two is equal to the matrix. Just add them term by term. Beta, beta plus alpha, zero, beta. And the question then is, is that possible to be equal to vector 3, which is minus 2, minus 1, 0, minus 2. Alright, so if they're going to be equal, then if this is going to be equal to that, and they have to be equal on a term by term basis, and it turns out that this gives us a set of linear equations that we can solve. So, right, so we're going to look at this. Element 1, 1, beta, has to be equal to minus 2. Beta equal minus 2. This one, 0, has to be equal to 0. Check. We go up to this one. Beta plus alpha needs to be equal to minus 1. And then beta, again, is equal to minus 2. Those are the, the four equations that we get out of it. Beta minus 2, beta minus 2, check. We can plug beta minus 2 into there. And we get minus 2 plus alpha equal minus 1. Say alpha is equal to 1. So if we add vector 1 minus beta, so minus 2 vector 2, we do in fact get vector 3. Or in other words, they are linearly dependent. Take a look at the next exercise. Exercise 1.15. All right. So this one's another. Again, it's a, it's a linear independence question. So the two rows are for a, for a set of row vectors. Show that they are linearly dependent. So we have one, one, zero. One, zero, one. Three, two, one. Okay. So I'm just going to call these. A, B, C. And so again, the question we want to ask is, is there some combination of A and B that we can use to be equal to C? So, alpha A plus beta B is there some combination of alpha and beta? And again, we're going to do this just term by term. So if we do alpha A alpha alpha zero plus beta b beta zero beta equal to three two one and so on term if we analyze it term by term we get a series of linear differential linear sorry linear algebraic equations alpha plus beta is equal to three alpha plus zero is equal to 2, and 0 plus beta is equal to 1. Okay. So from this we need that beta is 1, alpha is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3. Uh, so alpha is equal to 2, so 2a plus 1b is in fact equal to c and they're linearly dependent. The second half says to show that the opposite is true for this other set of vectors. So this would be 1, 
one zero one zero one zero one one. Okay. Again, we're just gonna call it A, B, and C. Okay. Now we're gonna ask the same set of questions. Alpha A plus beta B equal question mark to C. We're going to get a series of algebraic equations, right? So this will be alpha A is going to be equal to alpha, alpha 0 plus beta B. Beta 0 beta equal to 0, 1, 1. I'm going to take these equations term by term. I'm going to get alpha plus beta is equal to 0. Alpha plus zero is equal to one. Beta plus zero is equal to one. Okay. All right. So from this we get that beta equals one, alpha equals one. And then we go to this top equation, one plus one is equal to two, not zero. And so there is no combination of alpha and beta that we can use to make a plus b equal to c. So no valid. Alpha and beta linear independence. Okay. Let's see what the next one is. Let's do exercise. Alright, so then we go into inner product. So we define our inner product space. And we get these wonderful theorems. Uh, for an inner product, that's that skew symmetry, positive definite, and linearity. Let's go looking for an example. And a little short on it. Go to subspaces. So a subspace is a vector space, um, is, a, is a set of vectors from a vector space where those set of vectors would form their own vector space under the same rules. Um, so they have to obey all the same principles. Exercise here, let's do another exercise out of the book. Another exercise out of the book. Projection operators. Hmm. This is a fun one. All right, exercise 1.6.1. An operator is given by the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. A three-dimensional operator. And the question is, what is its action? What does it do? So again, when we have an operator, we can determine how it behaves by understanding how it behaves on a given basis set. And so our basis set, you know, three-dimensional operator, let's just use the orthonormal basis set. X1, 1, 0, 0. X2, 0, 1, 0. X3, 0, 0, 1. So this would be like a vector along x, a vector along y, and a vector along z. Sigma times x1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, times 1, 0, 0. That is going to be equal to 0, 1, 0. So it's going to take the X axis and goes to Y. Sigma X two zero zero one one zero 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 one zero zero one zero equal to zero one. Oops, sorry, zero zero. Okay. So it takes the y axis and turns it to z. 
and then sigma x3 basically by 90 degrees. It takes uh, x to y, y to z, z to x. Okay. And so that's the action of that operator. S goes to y, y goes to z, z goes to x. Oh, that's kind of fun. Let's do another exercise. Exercise 1.6.2. Ooh, this is a trickier one. Alright, so we have exercise 1.6.2. And this exercise says, given two Hermitian operators, omega and capital lambda, uh, that are Hermitian, what can we say about the product of the two operators, uh, the product of sigma lambda plus lambda sigma, the commutator sigma lambda, and i times the commutator sigma lambda. Okay, so that's the question. Uh, when looking at a problem like this, there are two general strategies. The first, and I will be honest, the one that I tried uh, when I first did this, and it's not a particularly great idea. The first thing that I did was um, I made two operators, sigma and lambda, and I just made little small major c's so I could see what would happen, right? So I made sigma. Uh, Omega one, omega one one, omega one two, omega two one, omega two two, and then I thought, well, this. And then I applied the the properties of being Hermitian. So, in a Hermitian operator, sigma, or say omega is equal to omega star t, right? So it's the complex conjugate transpose, and so that means that omega one one, omega one. And omega 2 2 are both real, and omega 1 2 equals omega 2 1 star. So we can write it omega 1 1, omega 1 2, omega 1 2 star, and omega 2 2. And you can do the same thing for lambda. And then you can multiply them together and see what you get. Um, that's really fine, and that gave me a pretty good idea of what I should expect with these. Um, and then you can use the rules of matrix multiplication and take an infinite dimensional thing, right? And so then sigma lambda becomes the product of one, oh, sorry, you know, sum of all dimensions, omega one n, n one, right? And we'll just sum over all of that. So that's one way to approach a problem, not particularly helpful. Uh, the better, more elegant way, which is just a different strategy, uh, is to use the property of a, of a Hermitian operator. So, given sigma lambda, sigma, or sorry, omega, I don't know why I keep saying sigma, equal omega transpose, lambda, well, lambda adjoint, what can we say about these different things? Right? What can we say about the product and in particular, we're going to be asking the question, uh, is that itself a Hermitian operator? Okay. So uh, what we can do is we can take the adjoint of the product. The adjoint of the product is equal to uh, the operators reversed and taken to the adjoint of each one. Now, these are each Hermitian. So we have lambda sigma. So we have the adjoint of sigma lambda is equal to lambda sigma. Now, if the commutator is equal to zero, right, then then we would have a Hermitian operator. Then sigma lambda uh, adjoint would be equal to sigma lambda. 
But if that commutator isn't zero, then we can't really say much about it. Or another way to think about this is, if we know uh, that uh, this is equal to that, then we can say that the commutator is zero. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really about all we can say with that. The second part of the question was, uh, what about sigma lambda plus lambda mega? Again, mega and sigma is killing me here. All right, what can we say about that? Well, we're going to start by taking the adjoint of both sides. Now, if this commutator is zero, then that's just two times the operator, right? So that's going to obviously be Hermitian. But um, what about this? Is that Hermitian operator? Well, we'll take the comp we'll take the adjoint. That is going to be equal to lambda adjoint sigma adjoint plus sigma adjoint lambda adjoint. And then we can say, you know, lambda adjoint is equal to lambda. Sigma adjoint is equal to sigma. Is equal to lambda sigma plus sigma lambda. All right. Or in other words, the sum of lambda sigma sigma lambda is always a Hermitian operator. Okay. So we can, that's always going to have real eigenvalues. It's going to have eigenvectors that span space all the properties of Hermitian operators. And the next question is, what about the commutator? Let's obviously assuming it's not in zero here. What is the commutator of two Hermitian operators? And can we learn anything about that? So what we're going to do is we're going to write this out. We're going to say, what is adjoint? Not complex conjugate. What is the com what is the adjoint of the commutator of sigma lambda? That is going to be sorry, omega lambda. Omega lambda minus lambda omega adjoint, which is going to be equal to lambda adjoint. Omega adjoint minus minus omega adjoint lambda adjoint. And then each of these is itself, so we get lambda omega minus omega lambda. Huh. Well, that's funny. This is equal to minus the commutator so the, the adjoint of the commutator is equal to minus the commutator okay all right so remember how we said that uh, hermitian and anti-hermitian operators were like the real and the imaginary numbers if you have some operator, some number, and you take the complex conjugate of it, and it's equal to minus that number, that number has to be purely imaginary. So if we imagine that some operator, let's call this uh, gamma, gamma is equal to the commutator, right? Gamma is purely imaginary. I B, where B is some real operator. Gamma is purely imaginary because <coughs> uh, it is equal to minus its adjoint. And by that same token, if we want to take a look at question number four, which is what is i times the commutator of omega lambda 
that we can say it's purely real. Because I times an imaginary number uh, is a real number. Okay? And that's what we can learn. And we did this by approaching it in a slightly different way, not by using uh, not by using individual elements, but by just using the property of Hermitian operators, we were able to learn something about the combination of two different Hermitian operators. All right, diagonalization of matrices. This is very much related to some of your homework. Find the eigenvalues and normalized eigenvectors of the following matrix. One, three, one, zero, two, zero, zero, one, four. Okay, so here's the deal. Looking at a problem like this, every time someone asks you to find an eigenvalue or eigenvector, there is mathematical software that will do it for you. There are numerical algorithms that make it very swift. Doing it by hand is a pain in the butt, but you should know how to do it. So. Define the eigenvalues. We're going to set the characteristic equation equal to zero. Right? So we get determinant that minus lambda i is equal to zero. Which is equal which means the determinant one minus lambda three one zero two minus lambda zero zero one or minus lambda. Okay. That determinant is equal to zero. And so now you can see we're going to get the third order polynomial, which is going to look somewhat ugly. Yeah. One minus lambda, two minus lambda, four minus lambda, three zero zero, one zero one, okay. minus zero, zero, zero equal to zero. Okay, so in this case it turns out to be pretty simple. Your eigenvalues are when that's going to be equal to zero, when that's equal to zero, or when that's equal to zero, so your eigenvalues are one, two, and four. And then once we have the eigenvalues, what we want to do is uh, determine the eigenvectors. So we have, to determine the eigenvector, we use the eigenvalue equation, such that sigma is equal to 1. Okay. All right, so our eigenvector, sorry, our, our operator times our eigenvector is equal to our eigenvalue times the eigenvector. And so we want to know is what is 1. So let's give it 1 is equal to a1 or x1, y1, z1. Okay? So what we have is this linear equation, right? 1, 3, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 4 times x1, y1, z1 has to be equal to x1, y1, z1. Right? That's what our eigenvalue equation says. Or in other words, we can just multiply this out. x1 plus 3y1 plus z1 is equal to x1. 0 plus x1, hmm, so we get y, so we get 2y1 is equal to y1. And the only way that can happen is if y1 is equal to 0. And then we get the last one, uh, y1 plus 4z1 is equal to z1, right? Did I do that right? Y1 is equal to 0. So 4Z1 is equal to Z1. Well, then Z1 also has to be equal to 0. And if Z1 is equal to 0 and Y1 is equal to 0, then 0 plus 0 plus 1, X1 is equal to 1. So 
for the eigenvalue after 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay. Let's try and find what the eigenvector is for eigenvalue number 2. So we solve for that eigenvalue, right? We're going to have let 2 x2, y2, z2. And then sigma 2, 2, two x2, two, 2 y2, two, 2 z2. Okay. And again, we're going to get that set of equations, right? So we have I get this down. 1, 3, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 4 times x2, y2, z2. Equal to 2x2, 2y2, 2z2. And then we just multiply these out. Right? So we get x2 plus 3y2 plus z2, 2x2, two, 2y2 two equal to 2y2. Two oh, I like that. All right, this time we don't have y equal to 0. Uh, and then y2 plus 4z2 equals 2z2. Two two. Okay. So, what are x, y, and z? Alright, so this one doesn't eliminate anything. Y2 from this equation can be anything. That's not that helpful. Alright. 4z2 minus 2z2. From this we can get 2z2 equal minus y. Right? Okay. So now we can go back to this first equation and we get x2 plus 3y2 minus minus y2 over 2 is equal to 2x2. Two Is that right? Hmm. X2 is equal to 5 halves y2. So we have x in terms of y, z in terms of y. So now we need to pick a number. Okay. And so, like you would expect, there's an infinite number of potential eigenvalues because they're all multiplied by a constant. Alright, so now we have, we pick any number for y. We can now write that 2 is equal to 5 as y2 y2 minus y over 2 okay and now what we want so this would be an eigenvector any number here would work as long as it follows that ratio but we do want this to be normalized to 1 right so to be normalized in 2 equal to 1. Right? So, we have 5 halves y2 squared plus y2 squared plus y over 2 squared is equal to 1. And then what we end up getting here is 25 quarters y2 plus 
4 y2 over 4 plus y2 over 4 1 so that's 1, 5, 30, 30 quarters so y2 squared let's do your squares here y2 is equal to the square root for and now you have numbers for, for, for 2. So then 2 is equal to 5 halves square root 4 over 30. Square root 4 over 30. Minus root 4 over 30. And that gives us our normalized eigenvector for 2. And then finally we can do the same thing for eigenvalue number 3. But we're going to call this 4 sigma. Let's define such that sigma 4 equals 4. 4. Alright, and so that means that 1, 3, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 4. 4 is equal to 4x4, 4y4, 4z4. Okay. Cool. Now, again, linear sets of equations x4 plus 3y4 plus z4 equal 4x4. Y. 2y4 is equal to 4y4. Again, y4 would be equal to 0. And then y4 plus 4z4 is equal to 4z4. So y is equal to 0 x4 plus z4 for 4x4. Four four. z here can be any number. Uh, so let's write z in terms of x. z 3x4. Or in other words, our fourth our four, eigenvector number 4 is equal to x4, 0, 3x, 4. So if we want to normalize that, what we end up getting is x4 squared plus 9x4 squared is equal to 1. x is equal to square root of 1 times. Yep. So, 4 then becomes square root of 1 10, 0, 3, square root of 1 10. Mm -hmm. And there we have it, the four eigen, three eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the equation number 4. Alright, I will stop there, and we will do some more problems in a bit.